If you want to get the best results when you're cooking, it is going to be imperative that you have the right recipe as well as the right ingredients. But guess what? The same is true as it relates to prayer. If you want to reach God and if you want to really connect with him in prayer, your prayer has to have the right ingredients. Welcome back to another episode of the Midweek Refill. I'm Bishop A. Reginald Lippman, your host and senior pastor of the New Mountaintop Church. We're in the middle of a series entitled Talking to God, taking a deeper look at the prayer that changes everything. And this week, we're going to be talking about part two of our series as we look at the model prayer and discuss the priority of God's kingdom. You don't want to miss this. So make sure that you like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment, even a question if you have one, and we'll do our best to answer it from the scriptures. Also, down in the description box below is a free PDF. It's full notes of this entire teaching along with discovery questions and a six-day devotional. You're watching the Midweek Refill. I think this is going to be a good one. Stay tuned. Hey, and welcome back to another episode of the Midweek Refill. I am your host, Bishop A. Reginald Littman, and I'm excited about bringing this week's teaching to you. We're talking about talking to God, a deeper look at the prayer that changes everything. We've been walking through the model prayer that Jesus prayed, and this is part two of our session. Now, last week, we talked about how God wants us to understand the purpose of prayer. And we looked at Matthew chapter six, verses five through eight, as we talked about part one. In this week's episode, we're going to move on to verse 9 and 10 of Matthew chapter 6. And we're talking about the priority of God's kingdom. Of course, we believe in teaching and preaching verse by verse. And so you'll find that we will walk through a passage and get the real meat of the text. So it's important whenever you're studying the New Testament and the teachings of Christ to understand His audience and his context was quite different than what you and I experience and face today. In fact, when we look at the New Testament teachings, it's important to understand that there was a whole different world and way of thinking about matters. In fact, as Jesus taught on this powerful subject of prayer after the Sermon on the Mount, we find something interesting because Jesus provides a model prayer that begins with a focus on God's character and God's kingdom before he ever addresses any personal need. And that's quite important for us to understand in this lesson in particular because it's all about God. And that's the big takeaway that Jesus teaches in these passages of scripture from our key text for this particular week, is that it's all about God. It's all about worshiping and honoring God and putting ourselves last. And that's the message that we can all stand to gain some value from. So when we understand this, we understand that in Jesus's teaching concerning prayer, he reveals that the priorities of a believer's heart, and that is God first and then us second. Again, God first and then us second. And that's what Jesus teaches that we should have as our personal approach to prayer. And so, in fact, by focusing on God's holiness and his sovereignty, we're going to see Jesus emphasize that our prayer should be more than just a wish list but a declaration of who God is and a surrender to his will. So prayer is not just a wish list, a Christmas list, a list for 
Santa Claus, and we are not to treat God like a cosmic bellhop. In fact, we are to understand instead that prayer is a privilege. And in this week's teaching, we're going to see the relationship that we have with God while we pray and even beyond our prayers, but in particular, how we should really approach God as we pray. Now, it's important to understand, of course, that the context of the Jewish audience, they were familiar with many structured prayers, making Jesus' teaching here quite radical. But yet his goal was to bring a semblance of relevance and relationship and intimacy to our prayer life. Because for them, they were accustomed to having Prayers that would take place at certain times of day, and they had to be in a certain way in a certain place. But Jesus' efforts here is very simple. He wanted to teach them and vicariously us that prayer must have intimacy and reverence in order to be effective. And that's a great takeaway for us today. And so we're going to take a look at what Jesus teaches in Matthew 6 and 9 and understand prayer at another level. So don't forget to like, share, subscribe. Also, that down below in the description box, you can find a free PDF that is chock full of notes, questions, and a six-day discovery journal and devotional that you can Study with me for the next six days until the next episode. So let's jump into this week's teaching with the first principle. We see it in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 9. And the first principle that we learn from Matthew 6 and 9 is that prayer starts with reverence. Would you kindly type that into the comments, that word reverence? Again, prayer starts with reverence. Now, let's look at what Jesus teaches us concerning prayer beginning with reverence for God. Because in the text, we learn that Jesus says in Matthew 6 and 9, and this is where our first principle comes from, he says, in this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, this is a familiar prayer to most believers and many children for that matter, because if you were, um, you know, grew up in church, you had to learn and recite this prayer. Many people still use this prayer on a daily basis as their personal prayer. But one of the things I want to point out here is that when we only recite this prayer out of routine and habit, guess what can happen? We can lose the reverence for God and the reverence for the words that Jesus taught us to pray. And that's why he told them in this manner, therefore pray. What he was saying was, don't pray these words necessarily, but he was really saying, let me lay out a format for you to follow that, again, you have the right ingredients when you pray to get the right results when you pray. And so when Jesus says, after this manner or in this manner, pray, he begins with reverence. Notice this plural possessive pronoun, our Father. I love it. Notice that Jesus is teaching us that God belongs to all of the children of God. You know, the scriptures present Jesus as our elder brother meaning that Jesus shares his father with us. And so he taught the disciples to pray in the plural possessive, our, our father. Isn't that wonderful? What a reassurance that the God of the universe is also your and my father. So he also goes a little further with that because not only is he our father, but notice his location. His location is in heaven. And then he says, hallowed be your name. Now, Jesus is teaching us here that prayer starts with reverence. Again, prayer starts with 
reverence. And again, type that into the comments if you haven't done it. Reverence. Prayer starts with reverence. And what Jesus is trying to simply get us to see is that we have a connection with the Almighty God as our personal Father. He is in heaven, so he is high. He is seated upon his throne. He is exalted. He is to be worshipped. He is to be adored and loved and reverenced and respected for not only his high location, but his high activation in our lives as our Father. But he also teaches a third powerful principle here, and that is that the name of our Father is a holy name. Whenever you see that word hallowed, it's really old English, and it simply means holy, exalted, or highly lifted is your name. And so our prayers must begin with reverence for God as our Father. And of course, as a Father, He provides for us, He takes care of us, He defends us, He's there for us, He does for us what no other human being could ever or would ever do if they had the power to do so. And we must always remember in prayer that we don't order God around, we don't tell Him what to do, but we talk to Him like a Father. In fact, Abba is one of the Hebrew derivatives of father, and Abba is the first syllables to form on the lips of a baby. Baba, Abba, Mama. So it just teaches us, I didn't just speak in tongues there for those of you who may have an issue with that, but it just teaches us about the relevance of God the intimacy of God, the infancy of the children of God, that we should always look with great admiration and great respect toward the God who is our Father. We should pray to him as our Father, and uh, we should also see him as highly exalted because he reigns from heaven above, and his name is holy. His name is to be praised. And that's what Jesus teaches us in the first part of this, in verse number nine. And again, that is that prayer should start with reverence. So when we look at this family, we we also discover that prayer recognizes God as father, signifying a very close relationship with God. And that's just beautiful to me because I'm just like everybody else, flawed, imperfect, but forgiven and a child of God. And he allows me to refer to him in all of his holiness as my heavenly father, because through prayer, he wants to cultivate a meaningful relationship with every one of us. Jesus also acknowledges God's holiness with that phrase, hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. Reverend is your name. And so really what Jesus is teaching here is a dual approach, a balance between intimacy with reverence. So when we pray, we should be talking to God as our father who sits up high, whose name is holy. And in our prayers, we should have, again, a dual balance and a dual approach to intimacy combined with reverence for the Most High God. That's how he wants us to interact with him. Well, let's look at the second point that Jesus teaches us in Matthew chapter 6, verse number 10, the A clause. He teaches there that prayer should reflect a desire for God's kingdom, a desire. Type that into the comments, desire. So prayer should reflect a desire for God's kingdom. Now, this is really important. It's a short line, but it's a powerful line because in Matthew 6, 10, the A clause, Jesus says, your kingdom come. Notice, not mine, not my cousins, not your grandma, but God, Father, 
let your kingdom come. Now, the kingdom in this context is the, the dominion of God, the will of God, the wishes of God, the wants of God. So he's teaching us here that we must be praying for a desire or with a desire for God's kingdom. In other words, God, I don't want my own dominion. I want you to reign. I want you to be king. I want you to be enthroned. And I want you to make my whole life, my world, work life, family life, financial life, business life, you name it. Make it your dominion. Make it your home and sit on the throne in my life. That's powerful. That's really, really powerful because Jesus is telling us that when we pray, we should be expressing a desire for God to rule and reign in our lives. Have you ever known people who would pray that God would put them in charge? (laughs) I do. I know people who pray that way. God, let me be in charge. Let me be the head honcho. No, that's not what Jesus is teaching. He's teaching humility here. And he's teaching us that our prayer ought to be that God reigns and rules in every area of our lives. And that's so powerful because we want God's kingdom at work in our lives and not our own. And so the prayer moves from reverence to seeking God's rule and God's reign, from reverence to God's rule and God's reign. And you ought to desire as a child of God, the rule and the reign of the Lord in your life. You want him to rule. You want him to reign in your life. Because when you and I rule and reign, we ruin. We ruin. I shared with our church a couple of weeks ago that the difference between the word run and ruin is I. And when we insist on running our lives, We insert ourselves in the center of run, R-U-I-N, and then we ruin everything. We want God to rule and to reign. And when you pray, that should be an important ingredient in your prayers to God. It's important because desiring God's kingdom means longing for his values, his justice, his love to transform our world, and to transform our hearts. And family, that's what we should want, is for his kingdom and for his love and his justice. We need that right now. You may be watching this later on, but we're approaching just days away from the 2024 presidential election. We need God in this world as never before. His values, his justice, his love, to transform, and to rule our hearts. If there's ever a time believers should be praying, now is the time. All the time is the time, but we really need God's kingdom to take over. So as a believer, what's my responsibility as it relates to praying for the world? Am I to just use my prayer life for myself? Well, daily ask God to align your heart and your actions with his kingdom. So when you and I align our hearts and our actions with his kingdom, we will then go out and make a difference in the world. But we should also be praying, remember that plural pronoun, our. We should also be praying in a way that we also pray for other believers and non-believers, that they too would come into son and daughtership with God the Father, so that God can have his way and do his work in their lives. And again, if you're getting something out of this, please be sure to like, share, subscribe, and do leave a comment. And also don't forget the PDF that is down below in the description box with full notes of what I'm teaching along with discovery questions and your six-day devotion. Well, let me share with you finally point three from this week's teaching. And it comes from Matthew chapter 6, verse number 10, the B clause. And here's principle number three for this week. Prayer seeks God's will. Prayer seeks God's will. Let's look at it. Because Jesus says 
in Matthew 6.10, the B section, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Again, your will, not my will, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And what a powerful teaching that is that Jesus, the master prayer and the master period, (laughs) teaches us as believers how to talk to God the Father. And so Jesus is teaching us here that our prayers should seek God's will. One of the great lessons of the old church that they taught us growing up, particularly in the Pentecostal denomination, was you end your prayers and your statements and your plans with, if it's the Lord's will. Why is that important? It's because we don't know what tomorrow holds or the next moment or the next second, but we do know who holds all of our tomorrows in his hand. And therefore, when we pray according to his will, we literally, don't miss this, we literally give God the space to say no. Now, you may say, well, I don't want God to say no. I want God to say yes. No, you don't know what's involved a lot of times in what you're asking God to do. That's why uh, the Holy Spirit has to come along and take over the prayer life so that We won't just ask with wrong intentions and for wrong motives. So when we pray in the name of Jesus and according to the will of God, and as Jesus taught here in Matthew 6, 10b, when we pray your will be done in earth as it is in heaven, we are literally saying, God, this is what I would like, but ultimately I want what you want. So direct my will that it falls into alignment with your will. And also there's an inference here when Jesus says your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Please remember that as much as we hate to talk about it, we are earth. We were made from the dust of the ground, according to Genesis. Therefore, when Jesus talks about the will of God being done On earth, he's also inferring, or we might also infer, perhaps I should say, that we should pray that God's will be done in this earth, in us, so that we will walk in his will. We will occupy his will. We will behave ourselves and conduct ourselves in a way that agrees with heaven. So when people encounter us, they ought to encounter heaven. They ought to encounter a little piece of of God and the God at work in us is at work in other people's lives. So that's a very important part of this teaching is understanding that we must pray and seek God's will and tell God, God, your will be done on earth. And let me just kind of infer also in this earth, just like it's being done up in heaven. And that friends is a prayer that seeks God's will. Again, like the old folk used to say, it's not what I want, it's if it's the Lord's will. And so it's important to understand that praying for God's will to be done means submitting to his plans and trusting that his ways are better even when they don't match our preferences. How many times have you prayed (laughs) And you told God what to do and you wanted him to do it a certain way and a certain time frame and a certain person and a certain hairstyle and a certain height and a certain weight and all of that. But you found out that if God gives you everything you want, you will not want everything God gives you. That's why it's an important principle to pray God's will to be done, submit to his plans and trust that his ways are better, even when they don't match up with our preferences. I hope you got a lot out of this week's study. Don't forget that there's a free handout that goes along with this. It's very detailed with much more than I have time to share. I want you to go get it. I think it'll bless you. So be sure to go down in the link below and download the free PDF. Get it, share it, print it, complete it. Look at it, study it, read the scriptures, do whatever you need to do to help you to grow. I enjoy bringing this to you. Thank you so much for watching the Midweek Refill. I'm Bishop A. Reginald Lippman, Senior Pastor of the New Mountaintop Church. 
And until next time, you go with God. Thank you.